If you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians this morning. And you're like, you're all going, that's not in the Old Testament. <laughs> Colossians is not Ezekiel, and that's right. We're not going to be in Ezekiel this morning. We're going to take a bit of a detour from our regular uh, Bible reading program. Last week, I mentioned at the close of our service that uh, this afternoon, this evening, that the leadership of the church is meeting with a candidate for our associate pastor position, and I encouraged you, challenged you, admonished you as a church to be praying, to be praying um, for God's will to be done. And then that phrase kind of sat with me this week. Well, what have I just asked our people to do? <laughs> what is God's will? How will we know if God's will shows up? <laughs> and how can we as a church be praying wisely for God's will? What does that look like? I mean, God's will obviously is a much broader topic than that. I mean, even as a church, uh, I mean, hiring a, a pastor, that's a big decision. We have other things, decisions that are before us as a church. We think of our building program, the ministry that's happening here. I mean, even personally, I know a number of you wrestling with some things personally in your own life. And a question that as Christians we should wrestle with is, what is God's will? What is God's will for my life? And that may be in regards to a, to a house or a job or, a, or schooling or some relationship. Uh, God, what is your will? And so I, I want to invite you this morning to kind of join me in my, my own wrestling with that question this week. As we together as God's church seek his will, what exactly are we looking for? <laughs> and how will we know if God's will shows up? The passage then that I was drawn to this week was Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, it's the Apostle Paul writing, and he's writing to the church at Colossae. Uh, Pastor uh, Eric was teaching this morning, he was talking about um, modern-day Turkey, and that's where you'd find the city of Colossae in modern-day Turkey. And he writes to them, and he says to them, follow with me, verse number 9, Paul says this, So from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. Uh, this is one of the, the great prayers that we have in Scripture, that the Apostle Paul prays for this church. And you'll notice the center of that prayer is what? Paul's prayer is that this church will be filled with the knowledge of God's will. <laughs> Well, that is a good prayer. That is a prayer that we should pray as a church. That is a prayer that we as individual Christians should pray, that we would be filled with the knowledge of His will. Now, we want to take a look at this passage and break down this passage this morning in regards to understanding and kind of trying to wrap our mind around God's will. But the first question that I had as I came to this passage and that Paul kind of inadvertently answers is this, why do we pray for God's will? Why would we seek to answer that question at all. Now you'll notice in our passage, verse number 9, what does Paul say? Paul says, and so from the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for God's will in your life. So in other words, there was a day that something happened in these people, and when Paul heard of it, he began to pray for God's will to be done. So I think, well, what day was that? And what did Paul hear about these people that would prompt him to pray for God's will? Well, to answer that, we've got to back up a few verses. If we back up to verse number 3 in our passage, Paul says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Why? Verse 4, Since we heard, what did he hear? Of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints. So Paul heard of the faith of these Colossian believers. Now, what we need to know about this church is we have no record of the Apostle Paul ever visiting the city of Colossae. In other words, Paul did not personally plant this church. Uh, some of the letters that we have, Paul's writing to people he knew, to cities he had been in. But the city of Colossae, we have no record of the Apostle Paul ever being there. The main city in the region was the city of Ephesus. And we know from the book of Acts, Paul spent three years in the city of Ephesus ministering and preaching the word of God. But it, all, it says uh, uh, that the word of God goes out from Ephesus to the surrounding area. 
Now, in our passage this morning, another man is mentioned. His name is Epaphras. And it's believed that sometime during Paul's ministry at Ephesus, Epaphras was from Colossae, and he travels to Ephesus for some reason. And while there, he hears the gospel, and he is saved. And the result of that is he takes that message back to his city. He preaches the gospel. More people are saved, and a church is planted in the city of Colossae. Word of that then finds its way back to the apostle Paul. And upon Paul hearing that a church has started in the city of Colossae, what does Paul begin to pray? That they would be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now, I want to just explore a little bit more what exactly happened to those people. If we continue verses 5 and 6, see if we can understand what happens to this people. Verse 5, partway through, he says, "Of um, Of this you have heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed is in the whole world, bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. So so what happened here? He talks in these verses. He says it's the word of truth, the gospel. He said that they had heard and understood the grace of God in truth. In other words, Epaphras had come from Ephesus and he come back to Colossae. And what did he begin to preach? He began to preach the gospel. He began to preach the word of truth. Epaphras began to declare that there was a holy God, and before that holy God, uh, the people of Colossae were sinners, and they stood condemned before that holy God in his wrath. However, Epaphras went on to tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus had stood in their place, that Jesus had died for their sins. And then Epaphras laid it out like this, you have a decision that you need to make. You need to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You need to turn from your sin and embrace the glorious good news of Jesus Christ. And what happened? (laughs) Many in Colossae did. They believed, and they were gloriously saved. Now, what took place in that moment of their salvation? Well, if we jump down to verses 13 and 14, Paul talks about it. He says in verse 13, He, that is God, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. In other words, the the people of Colossae have been born into this world in sin, just as you and I are born into this world in sin. And as such, we belong to the kingdom of darkness. We were enslaved to the God of this world. His name is Satan. He is the prince of the power of this air. And being born in sin, we are unable to see our sin and our own slavery to sin until the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ shines upon us and reveals our heart and reveals who Jesus is. In receiving Christ, what happened to these believers? They were delivered from the kingdom of darkness and they were placed into Jesus' kingdom, the kingdom of of light. Paul goes on to say in verse 14, they were redeemed, they were forgiven. In other words, they were bought back and ransomed. They were forgiven, they were pardoned. They were no longer slaves, but sons of their eternal Father. In other words, we would say this of what happened in Colossae. There, these people, their lives had been eternally and gloriously transformed. And it's in light of that incredible transformation that Paul says, I pray that you would be filled with the knowledge of His will. Now, why, why, would that, why would Paul say that? Why would they all of a sudden now need to know God's will? Because while the greatest change in their lives had happened, on the other hand, nothing had happened. They still had to get up Monday morning and go to work. They still had the same family members. They still had the same people around them. And yet they were eternally and gloriously changed. The question was, how are they supposed to live? How are they supposed to live as citizens of light in the kingdom of darkness? Because of Jesus Christ, their eternal destiny had been changed, their identity had been changed, their allegiance had been changed, their worldview had been changed, their passions had been changed. So what does it look like now to live in this world? And Paul says, that's why I'm praying that you would know God's will, that you would be filled with God's will, so that you would understand what that looks like. You see, God's will is not just a question regarding certain decisions we make. God's will is the very purpose of our existence. See, if you belong to the kingdom of light, then it should be your aim in life to do the will of the king of light. 
Fulfilling God's will is the heart of what it means to be a Christian. So we should pray and pray often that we would be filled with the knowledge of his will. But how can I know God's will? How can I know what his will is for my life? Well, Paul says his prayer is that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. A couple of words that are are significant in that verse. He uses the word filled and he uses the word knowledge. Uh, the, The idea here is that they are filled completely. They are filled to the full. And the knowledge that Paul speaks of here is a, is a deep, it's a full understanding of God's will. In other words, we would say it like this. Paul's desire for the church is that they would confidently know God's will for their lives. In other words, they would be completely filled with a deep understanding of God's will. Paul's expectation, his prayer, is that he does not want the church to be guessing at what God's will is for them. His expectation, his prayer, is that they would know what God's will is. And here's the challenge, because I think too often our understanding of God's will is that it's some kind of mystical knowledge that we can never maybe be completely sure of, right? It, it's, like, it's like trying to follow a path maybe that's overgrown or, you know, when you go hiking and there's supposed to be those markers on the trees and maybe you don't see so many markers and you're just not completely confident that this is exactly where you're supposed to be, right? Or maybe it's like trying to find your way around a room in the dark, Right? Even in your own house, when the lights are off, you, you kind of have to feel your way around. I mean, in the daytime, you just walk confidently across the room, but at nighttime, you, you're just not sure where that coffee table is. But if I were to ask the question this morning, are you in God's will this morning? Are you in God's will this morning? Can you answer that question confidently? Can you answer that question this morning with conviction? Because that's what Paul wants. That's what God wants for us. God's desire (laughs) is that we would not live this life second-guessing if we're in his will or not. God wants us to live this life in confidence that we are in his will and that we're following him. See, this is the contrast with Christianity and with man-made religion. Because in man-made religion, the follower has to keep guessing, right? The worshiper never really knows if they've done enough. They never know if they're really in line with what they're supposed to do. Thus, they need to do all that they can in hopes that it is enough. But that's not how our God operates. That's not His desire for you and I. God wants you and I to be filled with the knowledge of His will. And he uses the words here, he says, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Well, if you're in Colossians, just turn over a page or look across the page to chapter 3. What is spiritual wisdom and understanding? Chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. What is spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding? It is setting our minds on things that are above. It is reflecting on the things that are Christ. It is seeking after those things that are above and not on the things of this earth. So there's a contrast here. Spiritual wisdom is heavenly wisdom. Spiritual wisdom and understanding is is knowing the mind of Christ and knowing his heart. That's in contrast with what? Earthly wisdom or earthly understanding. Uh, Paul would talk about that in Colossians 2, 8, or James talks about it in James 3, 13 to 18. And in that passage, James says this about earthly wisdom, that it's characterized by jealousy and selfish ambition. Uh, The contrast is this, heavenly wisdom, spiritual wisdom and understanding is focused on God, and earthly wisdom is focused on ourselves, and we're at the center of it. Well, that's all good and well, but how do we know the mind of Christ? How do we actually set our mind on Christ? What does it mean to actually have heavenly wisdom? Well, you're in Colossians 3, just dump down to verse 16. God's will flows from God's word. Verse 16, Paul says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all what? In all wisdom. In all wisdom. Where do spiritual wisdom and understanding come from? The answer is they come from God's word. 
And notice, interesting, in Paul's prayer in chapter 1, verse 9, what is his prayer? That the church will be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And then he says in chapter 3, verse 16, his prayer is that the word of God would dwell in them richly. And what's the result of it dwelling in them richly? <laughs> they would know wisdom. There's a direct correlation here. There's a direct proportion towards the knowledge of God's word and the knowledge of God's will. The one who is filled with the word of God will be filled with the knowledge of God's will. The one in whom the word of God dwells richly will have a deep understanding of God's word. But it's not just a head knowledge. It's not just a memorizing verses. It's not just quoting scripture. Put a, put a bookmark in Colossians. Turn with me back to the Old Testament to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, Moses is speaking. Moses is, is addressing the people of Israel. His life is about to end. They've been wandering for 40 years. They're about to enter the promised land. Moses in the book of Deuteronomy is recapping for the people of Israel. He's setting them up for what comes next. And in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse number 5, listen to what Moses says to the people of Israel. He says, See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land that you're entering to take possession of. So what does Moses say? Uh, I've taught you all the statutes and the rules that God gave me. In other words, we say, Moses is saying, look, I told you all that God told me, right? Which would be the first, essentially the first five books of the Bible. I've, I've communicated that to you. What are they supposed to do? Verse 6, keep them and do them, for that will be what? Your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people's who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is wise and understanding. Verse 7, For what great nation is there that has a God so near as to the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon Him? So where, where did the wisdom and understanding come from? What were the people supposed to do? The people were supposed to keep God's word. And what would happen if they kept God's word? They would be wise and they would have understanding. So God's will flows from God's word, but, but also God's will follows obedience. Israel was told if they kept God's word, they would be wise and they would have understanding. And, and notice, they would be wise and understanding in a way that would be noticeable to the nations around them. But notice what it reflected back on. As the people of Israel kept God's word, the nations around them would look at them and say what? They wouldn't say, man, you guys are really smart. Like, no, what would they say? They would say, you have a God that's different from our God. Because <laughs> that's what spiritual wisdom and understanding does. It directs ultimately back to God. So as the people of God obeyed God's word, what would happen? <laughs> they would be wise. They would have understanding. And the people around them would see that wisdom and understanding and ultimately point and reflect back to God. Now, this is all well and good, but how does this help us understand God's Word? How does this help us answer the specific questions on our heart this morning? Right? I, I want to know who to marry. I want to know what college to go to. I need to know what car to buy. We want to know what pastoral candidate to hire. But as much as I read God's Word, He doesn't give me a name. <laughs> Right? You want to say, I want to know who I'm going to supposed to marry, Lord. Well, you're not going to find the name and the weight and the height and the <laughs> it's not going to be in here. So then, how does God's word help answer those questions? How does God's word help direct us when, when we need specifics, but God's word doesn't give us those specifics? Well, what does Paul go on to say? Go back to Colossians. Notice. When the, when the people of God are filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, what is the result in verse 10? He says, So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him. What is God's will in a nutshell? God's will is to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him. Knowing God's will translates into a life transformed by God. Now, similarly to earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom here, there's a contrast between a life that pleases self and a life that pleases God. Heavenly wisdom, right, leads to pleasing God. Earthly wisdom leads to pleasing self. 
So if I have heavenly wisdom, if I'm living a life that is, that is, uh, is, uh, is worthy of the Lord, is pleasing to Him, then what am I doing? Then I'm living in God's will. You see, when I'm asking what is God's will, I'm, I'm really asking how can I please God? Because God's will is the path that leads to the glory of God. Now, this is really key because when we tend to think of God's will, we tend to think of very specific answers and decisions. But the problem is that God's word does not directly answer every question we have or speak directly to every single situation we would find ourselves in. So the problem is it leaves us uncertain. But that's exactly the place God does not want us to be. God does not want us to be in uncertainty. God wants us to live confidently in his will. You see, I think the challenge is in how we understand God's will. I think it's far more helpful for us to think of God's will as a path, as a road that we're supposed to follow. It's a path of obedience, a path that leads to the glory of God. Now, if you think about that for a minute, if, if you were to give directions to somebody else to get to a place, so if, if someone after the service this morning said, can you give me directions to Walkerton? In giving those directions, would it be helpful or would it be necessary to tell them absolutely everything they would see between here and Walkerton? That would probably be unhelpful, right? They would probably be lost before they even got out of Concordia. So, so could you give directions to someone this morning to get to Walkerton in such a way as that they would have confidence to get there by only mentioning a few things along the way? Well, the answer is yes, we could. We don't need to know everything along the way in order to have confidence that we're on the right path. We'll be driving somewhere new and my children will ask me, Dad, do you know where we are? And I'll say, not really. And so they'll say, well, we're lost. I'll say, well, no, we're not really lost either. I said, well, how can we not be lost if you don't know where we are? I said, well, because I'm a man. No. <laughs> I would say, because I know where we're going. I know the destination. I know our destination is south, and we're going south. And I know that to get to our destination, we have to pass through these places. And we just passed through one and there's a sign for the next one coming up. So I've never been on this road in my life, but I'm not lost because I know where I know where it's going. You see, similarly in our Christian walk, we think that if we if we need to be in God's will, we need to know every single detail along the way. But A, <laughs> you couldn't handle that much information, and it would not be helpful. So what does God do? He sets out some markers for us along the way. So that we can know as we follow him that we're in his will. What are those markers? Well, Paul gives us four in this passage. He says, I want you to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. And then he gives us four markers to help us know if we're in God's will. What's the first one? Bearing fruit in every good work. So if you're in God's will, then you will be bearing fruit in every good work. You say, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, The answer to that is we can go to the Word of God, because God's Word tells us what fruit looks like. God's Word tells us what that's going to look like. I'm going to list just some of them this morning. Um, You can can do a whole lot more study on this, but what what are some of the fruit that God's Word defines? Well, leading people to Christ is, is bearing good fruit. So in other words, if we're pointing people to Jesus, then we're in God's will. That's a marker of being in God's will. Praising God is, is, is one of the fruits that a Christian is supposed to exhibit. So when we're mindful of God's work in our lives and quick to credit Him, uh, that's, that's good fruit that we're bearing. Interesting, giving money. Uh, when we're generous with our finances to help those in need, that is a mark of fruit in a believer's life. When we're living a godly life, uh, the writer of Hebrews talks about responding to God's discipline. So when we respond to God's work in our life, That's a mark of fruit that God's producing in us. When we have the fruit of the Spirit, when our lives are marked by joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and self-control, when those things are evident in our lives, what? God is bearing fruit in our lives. So if you want to know this morning, am I in God's will? The question is, is there fruit? Are you bearing fruit according to God's word? What's What's the second mark? The second mark, he says, 
in verse 10, bearing fruit in every good work. Secondly, increasing in the knowledge of God. Increasing in the knowledge of God. If you are in God's will, then you are increasing in the knowledge of Him. Well, what, is that, what does that mean? That means we're growing spiritually. That there's spiritual growth that's taking place. Well, what does that look like? Again, we can go to God's Word. God's Word defines this for us. What are some of those characteristics? Well, one, in the Psalms, it means a deeper love for God's Word. So if I'm growing in God's will, if I'm increasing in the knowledge of God, I'm going to be growing in my love and my desire for the Word of God. If God's will is setting my heart and mind on things above and, 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 and the word of God is to dwell in me richly, then one of the marks that should be in my life is there should be a growing love and a hunger for God's word. Uh, uh, John talks about a growing obedience. In other words, if I'm increasing in the knowledge of God, that's going to be reflected in my life, that my life is going to be more and more conformed into his image. In other words, I'm going to look less and less like Steve Gordon and more and more like Jesus Christ. Increasing in the knowledge of God means a maturing faith. It means we're living more and more by faith and less and less by sight. Increasing in the knowledge of God means a greater love for others. We're drawn to our brothers and sisters in Christ. So if I'm in God's will, there's going to be increasing, I'm going to be increasing in the knowledge of God. Thirdly, let's look at verse 11. So one, we're bearing fruit in every good work. Two, we're increasing in the knowledge of God. Three, verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. So if we're in God's will, we're going to be strengthened by his power. And how is that evident in our lives? Well, he says in this verse, it's evident through endurance and patience. Endurance and patience. When we pull back and look at the New Testament, those two words, endurance and patience, and we look at those words from a New Testament perspective, we find those words often located in the context of trials and hardships. So as I'm growing in the will of God, as I'm walking in the will of God, (laughs) God's power is evident in my life. How? By helping me to endure and have patience in hardships. Now, I would prefer God use his power just to get me around them altogether. Like, God, you can just give me the detour around those things. But no, Paul prays that God's will would be evident in the Colossians' endurance of those trials. God's will is to strengthen us with his power so that in our trials we will have endurance and patience. The last trail marker here. We see in verse number 12, so one, bearing, good, bearing fruit, two, increasing in the knowledge of God, three, being strengthened in God's power, and four, what is it? Giving thanks, giving thanks. If we're in God's will, then we are thankful people. Paul writes in Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So our hearts are filled with gratitude. We give thanks. And, and Paul, there's many, many reasons to give thanks. Paul gives us three reasons in these verses here. In verses 13 and 14, one, we give thanks because he's qualified us. We have an inheritance in heaven. What did you do to earn and deserve that inheritance? Nothing. That's all of him. So we give him thanks. He says in verse 13, he's done what? He's delivered us. What did you do to be delivered from the kingdom of darkness? Nothing. It's all of Him. And so we give thanks to Him. What does He say in verse 13? Not only has He qualified us and delivered us, He has redeemed us and forgiven us. What, what, did, what did you do to earn that redemption and forgiveness? The answer is nothing. And yet He separates as far as the east is from the west our sins. So we as God's people have much reason to be thankful. We have much reason to glorify Him. Now these four marks will mark out God's people. These four marks are the guideposts on us this morning. So when I ask you this morning, are you in God's will? The question is, do you see those marks in your life? Do you see those things? Can you, can you look at the trees as they pass by in your life and see fruit and an increasing in the knowledge of God and, 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 see, and see the power of God working through you as you endure trials and, and see it in giving thanks to Him? Now, I think Vanjie um, hit the nail on the head this morning when she talked about the importance of the body of Christ. Sometimes it's hard to see those things in our own lives. And that's part of the reason why we have the body of Christ, to mutually encourage and build one another up, to help us see those things, because sometimes we just lose sight. It's really hard to see those. 
And so that's what it means to come alongside brothers and sisters in Christ and mutually encourage them in Christ. Help them to see the work that God is doing in their life. Because it's interesting, a number of these things that we would see as markers of being in God's will are often things we would use to say we're out of God's will. <laughs> life is hard. I mustn't be in God's will. No, maybe you're right where God wants you. And so brothers and sisters in Christ come around to help us see that and to encourage that. So let's sort of try and bring this together here this morning in in something that's helpful. Um, Why do we pray for God's will? Well, we pray for God's will because we're in Christ, because we're saved, because we need to know how to live in this world. How do we know God's will? Well, we know God's will through His Word and His Word dwelling in us. So then then what is God's will for my life? It's living a life pleasing to Him. And the evidence of God's will is a life or as a church marked out by spiritual wisdom and understanding. And this is seen in their fruit and our deepening relationship with God and our patient endurance of trials and a heart filled with gratitude. So how does this help us understand God's will? So when you have something in your life this morning that you're facing and you're wrestling with and your question is, God, What is your will for me? How does this help us? Well, two questions that I think are are very helpful. The first question is, which path am I on? Which path am I on? Am I on the path of God's will? And that path leads where? That path leads to the glory of God. Is that the direction that my life is going? Now, that's a fundamental question, first off this morning, to even say, are you in Christ this morning? Has there been a day and an hour where you have bowed the knee to Christ, when you have received Him into your life? And then that's fundamental because that's actually the change that happens. What happens when we're saved? Well, before we're saved, who are we living for? We're living for ourselves. We're living in sin. And the moment of salvation is to repent of our sin and to turn to who? To turn to Jesus Christ and to live for Him. It's to embark on that journey of following Him. So have you made that decision this morning? Have you made that commitment to Christ to follow Him? And then are you, are you continuing to seek to live for Jesus? See, here's some of the challenge when it comes to God's will. I think too often our prayers for God's will are, are, are really a veiled attempt to get God to approve what we want. Right? To get God to approve what we've already decided we want to do. Right? We say, God, show me your will. But if we're honest, we really mean, God bless my plans. I already got it figured out. If you just give me the okay, we'll be good. Surrender is the key to God's will. Because it's His path, it's His will, it's not mine. Which means that path may take me places that I don't want to go. But I have to be willing to say, God... It's your will. I will follow your path. So are you on the path of God's will this morning? Then the second question would be this. Is there evidence of God's trail markers then in your life? So are you bearing fruit and increasing in the knowledge of God? And are you uh, um, increasing in the knowledge of God and in God's strength and during trials? Are Are you living a life of gratitude? Right? Again, these are the evidences that I'm, that I'm, on God's path, that I'm in His will. And and this is helpful because if I have a specific decision before me to make, if I'm not living in God's will, then I'm not going to be able to make that decision wisely. right? If I'm not bearing fruit, then I'm going to be tempted to place my identity in something other than Christ. If I'm, if I'm not developing a deeper walk with the Lord, then I'm going to be tempted to live for myself instead of Him. If I'm not being strengthened in my trials, I will be tempted to look for an escape. Right? If I'm not content, I will be tempted to make rash decisions. And that's going to lead me further away from God's will. So the first thing I want to understand, am, am, I, am I in God's will? Am I living a life that's following to Him? And then as you face the the specific questions and the details of life, then these markers help us in deciding, right? Think of that decision you have before you, whatever it is, and ask yourself these questions. Will this help me bear fruit? Will, Will this deepen my walk with God? Will this point me to Christ so I can endure my trials? Will this help me be content? Those questions then help direct us in understanding God's will. Several years ago, Abby and I were in the market looking for a house. And the house that we have now, we bought in 2017, and we were over a year in that journey. 
right? And these are some of the questions that we had to wrestle with. You say, well, how, how does a house, like, how does that fit in anywhere? Well, I think these questions are very helpful in something like that. But we'd ask ourselves, is this house going to help us bear fruit? What's a house? A house is a place that God wants to use. But if we buy this house, are we going to be able to use it for God's glory? Or is it going to become an idol in our lives where we don't want anybody else messing it up? Will this deepen my walk with the Lord? My wife and I, we love projects. And we found a property that we loved. We still drive by it today and go, oh, it was perfect. It was perfect. The house needed a ton of work. And I'm like, hey, I love it. That's perfect. But as we thought about it, I said, if we buy that house, it will destroy us. Because we will spend every waking hour on that. It will not help our family. It will not help our marriage. It will not help our walk with the Lord. We can't do that. It's just a house. We wrestled with contentment. The house we were in was clearly too small. We needed space. We needed space. That's what happens when you keep having kids. We need more space. We need more space. We came to the realization that said, if we're not content here, we won't be content if he gives us a mansion. Contentment is not about where we live. It's about our condition of our heart. So these questions, will we bear fruit? Will, will it deepen our walk with God? Will it point me to Christ? Will, will it help me be content? What do these questions do? These questions help put our hearts in the right place. Now, we bought a house. We praise the Lord. We're very grateful for the house that God gave us. There's many houses that we could have bought. The question is not so much about which one. The question was the process that God uses in our lives. So I want to end this morning because... I kind of began this whole journey this week thinking of the meeting that the leadership is to have this afternoon with uh, a candidate. And so how, how do we pray for God's will? How do we pray God's will would be done in this specific area for our church? Uh, well, uh, we would pray like this. <laughs> we would pray that God would bear fruit in us. We would pray that, that God will grow us in our knowledge of Him. We would pray that God would strengthen us to endure. We would pray that God would make us content because it's only when those things are happening in our lives are we going to be in the proper place to make a decision to glorify God. And so I would ask you this morning as a church to pray, to pray those things specifically for the leadership as they meet this afternoon, that the leadership would be bearing fruit in their own lives, that they would be growing in their knowledge of God, that they would be strengthened by God's power to endure the trials that they face, and that God would make them content, because it's only as God's doing that work in the leadership's lives that they're going to be able to make a wise decision. And then we as a church would extend to us, if the Lord willing, it goes there. But then we would also pray in this way, as we think about somebody to come to our church and, 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 and possibly join our staff and help uh, lead our church, we would want somebody who's going to encourage us in these things. We want somebody who's going to encourage us to bear fruit. We want somebody who's going to help us grow in our knowledge of God. We want somebody who's going to strengthen us to endure. Uh, we, we want somebody who's going to help us be content in what Jesus has done in our lives. So these things shape does that mean there's only one person out there in the world that fits that? No, there's probably many people. <laughs> Hopefully there's many people. We need wisdom to say, okay, Lord, what does that look like? As we walk in your will, we want you to direct us. Because what happens when the people of God walk in God's will? The result is God is glorified. The result is God is honored. The result is the people in the community look at the people of God and go, man, you're different. What is it about the God that you serve? What is it about the God that you follow? And that's our desire. That's the testimony we want to have in our community. And that happens just even in simple decisions like this as God's people are willing to follow God's word. Let me pray for us this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for... Again, your word, so grateful for your word that you give us. And we would pray, as, as Paul has prayed here, that we would be filled with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, God, so that we would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. God, that is our heart's desire and our heart's cry to please you because you are our God. You are the one who has saved us and has set us apart. 
So God, we pray that for us as a church, that you would lead us and guide us, especially God, this afternoon, pray for our leadership. Lord, we need your wisdom. We need you to go before us. God, I pray that for each person here today as, as, as they think through the questions on their heart and the decisions that they need to make, God, that you would lead them in those decisions, give them wisdom, help them to follow after you. God, help us to see the markers, the trail markers in our lives that we would confidently go forth in your will and that you would lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen.